Hey, welcome to my new show, The Centrifuge, where we go through the claims made in health podcasts and shows and spin out the BS from the science-backed information. In this episode, I'd like to continue going through a health podcast featuring Dr. Casey Means, who is an American medical doctor, entrepreneur, number one New York Times bestselling author, and a health educator, as she was on the Jay Shetty podcast. Now, the first episode released last week, but you do not need to have actually watched that one to continue with this one. So here's what Dr. Means covers and what we will be covering. Number one, getting more involved or advanced health testing for your health. Number two, doctors are not being taught how to interpret lab results in a way that will help you with your health. Number three, she takes things a step further by discussing how medicine ignores particular health markers because there's no drugs to treat them. And number four, finally, we'll also discuss a study on eating and how it massively reduces the risk of metabolic syndrome, a cluster of diseases by an extremely simple hack. Like last time, I'll supply you with the highlights at the end if you're short on time or don't know what to take away from all this. Let's spin down the BS. Just quickly speaking to function health, that is like the next level. And that is, if it's something that's accessible to you, I recommend every single person in the world do this if they can. Because it's over 100 biomarkers, like you said, for less than $500 less than the copay that you would pay at the doctor's office for like 10 labs. And what that will do is actually give you a hyper granular picture of what's going on inside your body and your metabolism. And I mentioned that there are three hallmarks of bad energy. There's chronic inflammation, there's oxidative stress, and there's mitochondrial dysfunction. And the beauty of the function health test is that they actually have tests that will tell you about each of those. So you can really know what's going on. Dr. Means is talking about this function health extensive panel of tests as a next step from the basic nearly free tests that she discussed in our last episode. Now I will link that for you if you're interested. She discusses three hallmarks of bad energy, which is her term from her somewhat recently published book, The three hallmarks are mitochondrial dysfunction, chronic inflammation, and oxidative stress. Now, these are good choices and often mentioned in the literature. There's often disagreement in what should be considered and what shouldn't, like in this review where the researchers mentioned the hallmarks are integrity of barriers and containment of local perturbations, maintenance of homeostasis over time, recycling and turnover integrations and circuitries, circuitries, excuse me, and rhythmic oscillations, and an array of adequate responses to stress, homeostatic resilience, hormetic regulation, and repair and regeneration. No wonder scientists can't communicate well with the public. That sounded like a bunch of nonsense. I can understand how someone would prefer bad energy over that mess. Okay, so there's other reviews focused on aging that do incorporate mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic inflammation explicitly, and they certainly acknowledge oxidative stress, though they mention several others as well. So all in all, I like her list, though it may not be complete for the top researchers in the field. Okay, so good choices, but then the claim turned to Functional Health, the company that she and Mr. Shetty are investors in, test directly for all three of these problems. So I decided to look for myself. They have an extensive panel of inflammation measures like high sensitivity C-reactive protein and multiple measures of immune cells. So they definitely test for chronic inflammation, one of these hallmarks. However, there are no specific tests for mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, I would know as I was involved in mitochondrial research for 10 years, and there are also no direct tests for oxidative stress. In fact, most, if not all, of the chronic inflammation measures are actually found on basic blood tests. So if the idea is to pay a lot of money for these specialty tests focused on these three hallmarks, I would save my money. To give functional health credit, uh, they do have some additional tests that are less common, like measuring omega-6 and omega-3 fat levels, lead and mercury testing, and more. So if that is the reason that you use functional health, it may be worth it, just not for these three hallmarks discussed. The takeaway here is that if you're looking to measure your oxidative stress, your mitochondrial dysfunction, or your chronic inflammation, 
you'd be better served by using a routine blood test rather than the functional health testing. It's much cheaper and just as effective. But I think, I think something that's, again, hopefully empowering and not too scary is that at the best hospitals and medical schools in America, like Stanford, where I went to medical school, doctors are not learning how to interpret lab tests in a way that will help you be empowered to live a healthier life. We are only learning a very algorithmic way of looking at lab markers in isolation in order to prescribe medications. If LDL is high, prescribe a statin. If glucose is high, prescribe metformin and so on and so forth. So the claim being that doctors are not taught in medical school how to analyze health tests in a way that will help you have a healthier life. Now, I was actually debating covering this one simply because I'm not a clinician, so the diagnostic side of things is slightly outside of my education as a PhD in medicine. But I'll say that it does seem true that physicians are trained to look at irregular blood values and make quick determinations based on those blood values. Now, I feel, and that's a key word there, feel, not evidenced, that most doctors likely look at the context that they have in front of them too. I can only speak from my experience, but each physician that I've had has looked at my blood work and applied context to it. Case in point, I just went a few weeks ago for my routine physical and I brought my blood work from my previous test so we'd have something to discuss. On that blood work and on all my blood work, my creatinine is always high. Now I know why, and it's not a concern to me since I've done the research explained here, but my physician looked at me and said, you're a muscular guy, you work out, and you take creatine. I'm not concerned about this high creatinine, but I'll do another test just to be sure. And we did another test, and sure enough, all good. I've had this experience with two or three independent physicians. So is that proof? No. But it does speak to the idea that physicians aren't all brain dead and looking at blood work like a robot. There's definitely an algorithmic style to some of it, like heart disease prevention using a risk estimate calculation. So Dr. Means is right to, to, that, to some degree. But my take is that it's more nuanced and especially with a great physician. <clears throat> okay, so I hesitate here because I'm presenting an argument mostly based on anecdote, which is not my style. So if you want to disregard everything that I just said, I think that's fair. However, what is claimed next is far more science heavy and in the same train of thought. And what's really interesting is that for the biomarkers that we do not have a good drug for, we ignore them, like triglycerides. You rarely hear about triglycerides, even though they're more associated with heart disease than LDL. We only hear about LDL because we have a medication for it. If uric acid is high, here's allopurinol. So we focus on the biomarkers that have a drug for them and what they don't learn is how to look at the labs in concert with each other to read the tea leaves of what the labs are saying together to tell you about your core physiology. Mm. All right, this one struck me because I was actually curious if something like blood triglycerides do track better with cardiovascular disease than something like LDL. Triglycerides are a particular type of packaged fat molecule and LDL is the carrier particle that contains triglycerides and cholesterol. Generally, up to now, to Dr. Mean's point, medicine has focused on lowering LDL concentration in the blood to help prevent plaque buildup in our arteries, so it's atherosclerosis, as these LDL particles are the prime suspect for the buildup in our plaque in the arteries in the first place. So, is it then true that triglycerides track more strongly with heart disease than LDL cholesterol? Well... <laughs> The answer is not as clear cut as Dr. Means makes it out to be. For example, without much effort, I found two studies that showed the opposite. So triglycerides either did not associate or did not associate as strongly with cardiovascular disease as LDL cholesterol. Still, that doesn't mean that she's wrong, as there's also studies that do indicate a stronger relationship with triglycerides. You can tell that the confident explanation may need to be adjusted to a little bit more nuanced one. Though, there may be something to the point itself. However, addressing this from a different angle, is it true that there are no medications for triglycerides? No. 
We have multiple from phenofibrate, pemafibrate, and others, including trials using omega-3 fats that people go on about. In fact, while statins are often prescribed, and I know some people feel strongly against those, there are studies comparing against statins using these triglyceride-reducing drugs, like here, where the triglycerides are measured, and we can see in red that the triglyceride drug reduced triglycerides substantially compared to the placebo, which was given a statin alone. Also, using an example like metformin earlier is a bit comical, considering that the price of metformin is as low as just a few dollars per month. So it would be in the best interest of the pharmaceutical companies to focus on lowering triglycerides as much as they could, because they make way more money. If only they'd been able to show that it was actually effective, which they fail to do in most circumstances. The key points here are that lowering triglycerides is a good thing to do, but it probably shouldn't come at the expense of reducing one's LDL cholesterol. And doctors aren't ignoring triglycerides because there's no drug to reduce them. They reduce the emphasis simply because the evidence isn't as strong. One of the big ones that I've struggled with for a very long time, because I remember feeling like I had to do this quick and fast forever. You talk about eating slowly, which I think sounds like the easiest, simplest, but underestimated habit. So yeah. could you walk us through that? It's incredible. This is also my biggest challenge as it's well. It's so hard. Especially as a surgeon, like I just would wolf food down. And research strongly shows that the people who eat the slowest have a four times less likelihood of developing metabolic syndrome than people who eat the fastest. So literally this has nothing to do with what you're eating. It's how you're eating. So this should be very empowering for people because it's like, even if you don't want to change the actual food, change the speed at which you're eating. And that does change everything. The average American family is eating fewer than th three meals per week at a table with the family. Like this is, this has become so normal now that we don't eat with other people. We eat in our cars, we eat while we're walking, we eat on the go. And I think just the key message here is that the more you can invest in sitting down at a table and eating slowly and mindfully, it's literally going to have a profound impact on your core metabolic health. I think this message is a really good one, emotionally speaking. Now, I absolutely identify with the idea of eating around others and slowing down. It's tough to do sometimes, especially as I, I sometimes prefer to be a hermit, but it has benefits outside of the obvious physical health. That said, what about this study? What about the physical health benefits? Well, I actually found several studies looking into this hack and I thought it was quite illuminating, but not necessarily in the best way. Now, before I touch on that, if you're interested in a deeper dive on the relationship between triglycerides and LDL, on why oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction being separate may not make any sense, as well as a specific test for these hallmarks, a closer look at the triglycerides relationship to cardiovascular disease and even more, then check out the extended version of this episode. It comes with an article covering the main points too, plus you get all these benefits right here as a member of the Physionic Insiders, my own research platform and community that allows me to continue doing this kind of work for you. The link to check it out is in the description box. I hope to see you there. Admittedly, I have no idea which specific study Dr. Means is referring, but that's not on her. It's just the nature of most podcasts. Still, it doesn't mean that we can't find useful information on the topic like this meta-analysis that grouped 29 studies together to identify if there was a relationship between eating speed and a few different blood tests like triglycerides. Now, ultimately, they indicated that fast eating was related to increased risk of metabolic syndrome. Still, for reasons that I won't get into too much into boring depth, this study was pretty poor quality. So I turned my gaze to another that addressed many of the concerns that I had. This study confirmed that eating slower is linked to reduce risk of particular health issues like high cholesterol and triglycerides. Now, interestingly, that wasn't universally true, like having no link to type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure. 
Still, regardless of the specifics, which likely need to be hashed out, it seems that Dr. Means is correct. There's plenty of data that point in that direction, though there's some holes that would be nice to fill in the literature. I don't think that the difference is four times, and I look for studies that were in that realm. Many studies indicate benefit of slow, slowing down eating, but none had that strong of a relationship. The key takeaway, though, is slow down. Just slow down eating. There may be some health benefits in it for you. So as usual, that was a lot, but we did cover a number of claims. So where does that land us applicably and scientifically speaking? Well, first, while Dr. Means may push for more extensive lab testing through a company like Functional Health to measure oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and chronic inflammation, after reviewing what they test, I'm inclined to disagree you would be better off saving your money and getting a routine blood test. That assumes you only care about those three hallmarks of health. You could check your C-reactive protein or CRP, as well as your immune cell count. That will give you some indication of your chronic inflammation. The other two hallmarks are not assessed directly by routine blood tests, nor by advanced testing by functional health. The second thing is, while trying to reduce your blood triglycerides is a good thing to do if they're elevated, the research is not as clear-cut on the benefits in relation to cardiovascular health. There's some evidence, but it's much more nuanced than uh, what was led on. I would opt for a focus on both, so LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. If both are in the normal ranges, you're likely in good shape. If one is elevated, especially LDL cholesterol, don't ignore it. Third, there's enough evidence to indicate, as Dr. Means pointed out, that slowing your eating time can have an effect at certain health metrics. So instead of inhaling your food, if you can, try to take a bit of time around it. Make it an event. If you're looking for more analysis, more centrifugation, more separation of reality from hype, then check out the episode on going over five simple, basically free blood tests as explained by Dr. Means right here. Otherwise, I'm not really done with the Jay Shetty podcast. The next episode releases right here next week. I appreciate you sticking it out with me. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.